Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm excited to be here today with Taylor Morgan. Welcome, Taylor. Shana, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be on. Yeah, we are going to talk about lifestyle optimization, or another way to say that might be work-life balance, and the idea of really being the captain of your own life. And I love that metaphor because, you know, we can we talk sometimes about people sleepwalking through life or just drifting, or even, you know, people who are successful, they've got it together, they've got family, you know, they've they've created a life for themselves. And at some point, that life can kind of go on to autopilot, right? Where you're not necessarily captaining your life. You're just going with the flow. And I find that that's not really that satisfying for a lot of people. So I'm really curious to hear about what you talk about. And can you describe, like, what, what would you say lifestyle optimization actually is? Yeah, wow. That's, that's a big question. <laughs> so it's kind of everything, right? Everything about your lifestyle. But, you know, in my program, I walk you through it in like the order that I believe is most important. So first and foremost is mindset. And so, you know, we talk about growth mindset and setting your core values, your mission statement, all that stuff. Yeah, Um, That's the base level. That's like the foundation of before you would even go do something or create something, you got to get into the, the mindset piece. You got to know why you're doing something and if what you're doing is leading you to fulfillment or not. Because as you mentioned in the intro, a lot of people are just kind of living on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And I think I got this from the seven habits of highly effective people. Stephen Covey, he talks about climbing the ladder of what you believe to be success only to get to the top and you don't like where you're at. Right. And that's, that can be because you didn't spend the time developing your mission statement, which is what I like to call your treasure map, uh-huh. because at, that leads you to your ultimate treasure, whatever you want in life. That's you get to decide that. Right. You get to decide rather than someone else put a treasure on a map. Exactly. It's not the, you know, the blanket success statement of get good grades, go to a good college, get a good job, get the wife, and that's it. You're successful. Yeah. A lot of people, majority of people, that doesn't work. Like they have to define it for themselves. And then the core values, I like to call that your compass directions. You know, things are kind of... I like the captain. Yes, all yeah, the, ship, the captain metaphor. Theme. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, the compass directions, because if you follow those core values, you know, living up to your own standards, the person you want to be, that should lead you to your ultimate goal, the, you know, the treasure map. It should lead you to your treasure. Yep. So yeah, that's the base level. You got to know where you're going before you start gotta, off on the you voyage. Set your course before you actually just randomly go to sea. One of the exactly. things that I love that you talk about that I was also curious about is accepting nothing shy of excellence. And I was thinking, you know, from one perspective, that can put a lot of pressure on someone. Like I have to be, you know, excellent at something or in excellence. But from another perspective, I could see 
wow, it's so easy to settle for something being mediocre or kind of okay, or realize like, we're not going to get everything we want. So, you know, there can be those perspectives. So how do you have people not settle for anything shy of excellence? What does that look like? Yeah. So I've thought about this a lot because growing up, I always, I was like obsessed with perfection. Not that I was a perfectionist, but I was constantly striving to make things perfect. But like now kind of thinking about that, I know that, you know, nothing can ever be perfect, but we're trying to get as close to it as possible. So I always had like this phrase in my head, like I'm on the pursuit of perfection, Hmm. knowing full well that that's never attainable, but you can get as close as you possibly can by continuously revising and And that was helpful for you or that was a hindrance you're saying? No, that was helpful for me. But I feel like excellence is a better word because I think that perfectionism (laughs) is like an infectious disease. I don't think it's a good thing at all. I think it holds people back from a lot of things because they're so focused on making it perfect. But if it's never going to be perfect, they're never going to release the thing you know, like the, a common example is social media. Like you have to wait until a post is perfect to send it out to the world, but you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. If you're running a business, you're not going to get anything done. That's why you put out the MVP minimum viable product exactly, and then, you know, let your consumers tell you, tell you, right. Whether it's actually going to sell or not and how to, you know, which, which parts to put more energy into and more creation. Yep. Exactly. So the excellence side of it, I like to say it's, you know, progress, not perfection. Uh So get the thing out there. It's not going to be perfect. You know, like going to the gym is another example. (laughs) You're not going to be fit before you start going to the gym. You have to start somewhere first and then, you know, progress. So it's not beating yourself up when things aren't, aren't perfect. And just knowing that it's the process, right? you never really reach the destination of excellence. Like you're never just, Uh, I'm excellent. It's the journey, the process towards becoming excellent. Yeah. And so another thing I like to say is pay attention to detail and make the little things, the big things. Hmm. So, but again, not going overboard with it. So not like OCD level to where you can't do anything else until this one little thing is perfect. Yeah. But just noticing the, the tiny details, you know, and how would you make like, what's an example of making a little thing a big thing? So in relationships is a huge example, yeah. you know, husband and wife are constantly bickering back and forth about the dishes being dirty or whatever, like that is a little thing. And, you know, usually stereotypically, it's the guy, you know, myself included, I do this, and I'm aware of it, I blow it off, you know, that's not a big deal. But Clearly, it is a big deal because it's causing this right, issue. It's causing so, friction. Yeah. Right. And so understanding that and taking a step back and saying, okay, I perceive this as a little thing, but uh-huh. clearly my partner does not perceive it as a as little, a little thing. thing. And sometimes what you might find out, as I'm sure you're well aware of, is that a lot of times it's not the little thing that was the issue. There's oh, no. some Never. underlying. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, it's miscommunication somewhere. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting, right? If in whether it's a romantic relationship or a business relationship or any kind of relationship, if there's something I like that, if it's something that seems like one person saying, oh, this isn't a big deal, it's little, but then the other person actually sees it as a big deal, right? There's there, there's a grain of sand that's rubbing someone the wrong way. So I like the idea of actually turning that into something where, hey, let's be willing to look at this as though it were a big thing that really mattered. Mm -hmm. without necessarily trying to find perfection, but really recognizing that, you know, if, if it's causing conflict, there's something here. And how do we actually relate to this in a way that creates something great for both of us, as opposed to only one of us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when someone doesn't accept anything shy of excellence, can you explain what that looks like without, you know, again, without someone being rigid or being an asshole about it? Like, how do they engage with that concept? Yeah, so it it can be a a pretty difficult dichotomy to not get caught up in, like, perfection and, you know, making sure everything is is perfect, but instead settling 
for excellence. So I like to say, as long as you're constantly progressing or, you know, at least trying to get better Mm -hmm. at whatever it is in whatever category, then that's all you can possibly do. That's, that is excellence. Yeah. Like don't worry so much about the specific outcome. Just worry about like, are you giving your 100% best effort in everything that you can? And if so, great. Yeah. If you're bringing your best effort, like you're bringing excellence, that doesn't mean things are going to turn out the way you thought they would. No, of course not. (laughs) There's, there's going to be a lot of failure. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's how you grow. What's been your experience around that? Like, what are some of the failures that you've been through in that way? Well, first, I like to say that I don't really have any quote unquote failures because I've been able to learn from those experiences. Uh I believe that you only fail if you either give up or stop trying. I love that. So, but I, I will say my biggest, you know, failure is or was when I was in the Marine Corps And I tried out for what's called the sniper screener. And so Mm -hmm. it's five days long of basically torture, you know, two, three hours of sleep a night, you know, constantly moving. You don't get to go home and shower like little food, little water, just a whole bunch of mental mind games. Edge. Yes. Yeah. They're trying to weed out who can make it into the sniper platoon. Yeah. And so I made it all the way to the end. I, I completed it. I passed, mm-hmm. but I was the only one of, I think, seven people who passed who mm-hmm. did not make the team. Wow. And that, that hurt me. I was going to say that sounds like it could have been devastating. It was because at the time I was not happy with my position as a machine gunner because there was some leadership issues, but mm-hmm. you know, that was, that hurt because we started with like I don't know, 50 some odd people. Mm -hmm. I made it through this horrible experience all the way to the end and then come to find out that I was the only one who did not make the team that passed. And I later found out that it was because that the other people who made it voted that I was not a team player. Wow. That I focused too much on myself Uh And didn't care so much for anybody else Uh because I've always kind of been physically capable and mentally capable of, you know, accomplishing extreme circumstances. Yeah. So even though it was very difficult, I could kind of handle that. Yeah. But obviously, if it's difficult for me, it's difficult for everybody else. And so everybody else is struggling. And I guess they saw that I wasn't doing or giving my best effort to kind of help other people along and achieve the same thing. So and in a you know, military platoon, that is a huge part of it is being able to work well together with other people. Yeah. And, you know, now looking back, they're right. Like I, I was just focused on me getting through it. So that I would say that was my biggest failure, but I'm glad I went through it. Not a failure. It sounds like, it sounds like it illuminated something really powerful for you, even in the midst of the, the pain and your life has taken a huge turn it seems like right now that you're not in the military anymore and you're using everything that you learned over there to support people. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. You were a machine gunner and tried out for the sniper. What was it called? The sniper platoon. The sniper platoon. I mean, that's an experience, you know, not a lot of people have maybe, you know, I don't know if I could say not a lot, but you know, it's, it's, relatively rare, right? For people who are civilians to actually identify with that. And the piece around teamwork and collaboration, you know, it's a really beautiful lesson as painful as it was. Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm curious how that's helped you now, especially in the work that you're doing and, and supporting other people. Yeah. Well, like I said, it made me realize that I am not the center of the universe, right? Like I I don't matter, you know, in the whole grand scheme of things, like I'm just one person Mm -hmm. and that's not how I was going about life. I was going throughout life. Like everything was focused on me, Uh even though at the time I didn't necessarily know this, like in the sniper screener, like this, this kid passed out and I had to, carry him like physically carry him on my back for the you know the rest of the way yeah and 
you know, so there were times wherein I was. Yeah, that sounds know, like teamwork. Teamwork. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so when they told me that that was the reason why I got upset because mm-hmm. I was like, well, I did this, this and this. It's like, OK, well, clearly they saw something else. So it doesn't matter what I think. Like, yeah. I clearly need to work on my teamwork. Yeah. And so that and other experiences have helped me in business, you know, when I'm looking to hire employees, like it's not just about what I want, but how can I help them help me? Yes. So instead of asking, you know, what can you do for me? Instead, I'll say, how can I better support you in whatever, you know, whatever goal or whatever. Yes. Right. Exactly. We're, we're needing to accomplish here. That's powerful. I was just thinking too about, you know, what you said, like, I don't matter. I mean, on the one hand, that feels defeating, right? Like, oh, I don't really matter. But on the other hand, it sounds like it's freed you up to see a bigger picture, to include mm-hmm. other people. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you look at life, like the universe, me, Taylor Morgan is a I don't even know, millionth of a fraction of a second in time. Like it, yeah. it's nothing. But like me living my life, like obviously I think I'm important. I feel like I'm doing good work. I'm trying to to help people to change the world. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of see it from both ways. Like anytime something quote unquote catastrophic happens or, you know, it's like just realizing that it really doesn't matter. Hmm. Like I think I heard this on a Tim Ferriss podcast. One of the questions he asked was like, if you could have one thing put up on a billboard for everybody to see, like, what would it say? And his guest said, just relax. Like, will this matter in five years? Uh You know, like most of the stuff we worry about really doesn't matter. And it's just unnecessary stress. Yeah. So, yeah, it (laughs) definitely goes both ways there. Like, It can seem like depressing, like I don't matter, but. At the same time, it's liberating to know that. Right. Yeah. I can feel the liberation of that, you know, the, the things that I get caught in day to day. And sometimes I do. I really look ahead to five years or at the end of my life and like, what will this have mattered? Or, you know, even if it would matter, how do I want to handle it that's not based in stress and anxiety? Because that usually doesn't get me where I want to go anyway. It's more living in the moment. Yeah. Like, Traffic is a common example. People are so stressed out and angry at the traffic. It's like, okay, well, can you do anything about it? No. So you can either sit there and be stressed yeah. and, you know, raise your cortisol levels and ruin your health right. or you can practice some breath work. You can listen to an educational podcast. You know, there's things that are in your control yeah. that you can do instead of just being stressed out about the past, worrying about the future, just enjoy the present moment. Because that's all you have. Yeah. One of your principles sounds like um, being obsessed with growth, you wrote on your website. And I can feel that, right? Oh, every moment is an opportunity to practice and to either become more conscious or to, right, reduce the stress on your body. What are some of the things that you practice daily in that way? Oh, man. Almost my whole entire day, definitely my whole entire morning is based off of growth and just personal development. So I, you know, I have a whole long morning ritual starting from 430 going all the way up until like 730. So I mean, that starts with uh, some stretching, some yoga, um, just getting the blood flowing. I like to talk about the cages method, which teach my program, my client actually came up with the acronym. Um, so shout out to him, but it's, it stands for cold exposure, uh-huh. affirmations, growth, exercise, and sunlight. So huh. these are the things that I feel like are needed in a morning ritual. So yeah. cold exposure for a whole host of reasons, but specifically in the morning, because it's a mental challenge. Uh-huh. The last thing you want to do in the morning is take a cold shower, mm-hmm. but that's exactly why you should, because if you start your day off with a challenge, everything else in your day is going to be easier. That traffic is suddenly not going to seem so bad. Yeah. Right. And then affirmations, that's things like uh, reading your core values, your mission statement, your goals, stuff like that. And then growth is any type of learning. So I like to read in the morning. I listen to educational podcasts in the morning. Um, It could be practicing skills, anything like that, because when you stop learning, you stop growing. You stop growing. Yeah, exactly. 
and then exercise, but not necessarily like, you know, break a sweat, but like I do yoga in the mm -hmm. morning. So some type of stretching, just something to get, something the to get blood your flowing. body online, your blood flowing. Exactly. Just to get yeah. moving. A great one is going outside for a morning walk mm -hmm. because that way you can combine the S, which is sunshine with movements. Um, and the sunshine is important because that wakes you up in the morning, uh, sets your circadian rhythm, which is your body's internal clock and, um, you know, wakes you up. It shuts off melatonin production and resets it for that night. Yeah. So the more sun you get in the morning, the better you sleep at night, the happier you are because of the vitamin D and all that. So that's great. Yeah. I love it. I've been actually more recently, you know, committing to those morning practices, especially with having a kid. It's been challenging, but I've been doing my yoga and actually including breath work and the cold exposure. I, uh, I still struggle with that one. I'm still a little bit of a wimp in that way. But, you know, what do you suggest for people who have kids and have to be at work at a certain hour? I mean, you get up at 430 in the morning. So I guess that's one way that you counter that. Well, I make sure that I get enough sleep. I disagree with, you know, the common thing. Oh, just wake up earlier. Well, if you're sacrificing your sleep to do that, you may be doing more harm than good. Uh -huh. So I say, cause you know, my clients are all busy entrepreneurs. Like they've got stuff going on. Yeah. And I always say, you know, until we get to the point to where we can completely optimize their day. But once they're first starting out, they feel like they can't add anything else. Right. Exactly. And so I, I just say something is always better than nothing. Uh huh. Uh huh. Doesn't matter. Read one page. That's better than not reading. That's at all. better than not reading at all. Right. Yes. Doing five push-ups is better than not, you know, just sitting on the couch. Yep. And most of the time, if you just commit to reading one page, taking a cold shower for five seconds, doing five push-ups, most of the time, you will You'll probably go more. a little bit more. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so just, you know, something is better than nothing. Don't commit to an hour a day if you feel like you don't have 15 minutes. Right. It's so interesting too, where time bends in a way, you know, like I wouldn't necessarily say that I had time in some way. And then suddenly the, right, the more I start doing things, the more I prioritize that over something else mm -hmm. and make that time or go to bed earlier, wake up, you know, and start to wake up earlier. So it is really interesting how... Once it becomes a priority, it seems like we make more time and space for it. That is exactly it. I always tell my clients and everybody, whenever I hear the excuse, you don't have time, that's all it is. is it's an excuse. not a priority. Everybody always makes time for their priorities. Mm. Always. If you can't make the time, it's not your priority. Interesting. I guarantee you, you know, if you have kids and you're at work in an important business meeting and you get like an emergency notification that your kid is injured, yeah. it doesn't matter what is going on, you are going to save your kid because that is your priority, yep. right? So it's, it's not that you don't have time. So that's, that's just an excuse that people give. I love it. That used to sound really harsh to me, but I think I get it more than ever. Because your language matters, Yeah. right? It's, you can say one thing and mean another thing. And so it's making these simple language switches from I can't, do dot, dot, dot to I won't dot, dot, dot. Mm. You know, most of the time you can go do that thing, but you're, you're, choosing, you're choosing not to. Yes. hundred percent. Yes. Same thing with like, I have to go pick up my kids. Well, no, you don't. You get to go pick up your kids. You uh -huh. want to go pick uh -huh. up your kids. You don't have to, you know, what if you didn't, they would stay at school longer. And I don't know, you could call an Uber. You don't have right, to. There, do there are other things that could happen. I could see that one could be right. People could debate these things like, but I do have to, or I do have to work, or I do have to put food on the table. And it also becomes really different energy around it when you recognize it as a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's all about understanding the whole premise around being the captain of your own life is realizing that you and only you are in 100% control of your thoughts and your actions. Mm -hmm. nobody oh, else yeah. can control you yep. and once you feel that it's empowering because part of the reasons why I like being an entrepreneur is whether I succeed or whether I fail it's 100% my fault yeah nobody else had any say in it it is all on me yeah. even if you have a hundred you know plus employees if your company fails it's 100% on you if the employees aren't you know performing 
that's your fault for not explaining or helping teach them, them. succeed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's all your fault, which sounds which harsh. Sounds harsh, but at the same but, time, that's the only place you have power to come from. Yes, Yeah. exactly. So what did you say that actually everything, it wasn't everything is a choice, was it? No, there was some other way you said that that was awesome. Oh, that you're the only one who has control. Mm. No one else can actually control you. Yes. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And a lot of that comes from uh, Jocko Willink. He's a Navy SEAL author of Extreme Ownership, uh -huh. basically talking about how, you know, because he was a, a Navy SEAL platoon commander. And so anytime he was leading at, you know, the highest level, the highest stakes, men died under his watch. Yeah. And that is a horrible thing to have to admit that, hey, this is on me. That yeah. was my fault. Yeah. And that's what the book talks about, you know, just having extreme ownership and understanding that you are in control of your own life. Wow. So powerful. It's almost like, okay, I have another question, but it's like, I almost want to end on that one because it's such a powerful, <laughs> a powerful part, but let's weave that in. So you talk about, you know, supporting men to be leaders and to be an inspiration to those around them. I would imagine that that is a part of it, right? When you actually take that full responsibility and you could say to your people, how can I support you rather than why are you doing it this way or this isn't working, right? Yeah. That's incredibly inspiring. What else do you actually teach people to be more inspiring? I mean, the biggest thing is leading by example. And one of the coolest, you know, experiences that I've had from the Captain's Lifestyle program is some of my clients go through the program and you know, they're because they're completely changing their lifestyle around yeah. and they're starting to work out. They're starting to eat better. They're getting, you know, more happiness, whatever it is. And then the people around them start to notice. Yeah. And so I've had clients who, you know, their mom is overweight and they've been bickering at her. Hey, mom, you need to eat better, exercise, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And mom doesn't want to hear. Mom doesn't listen. Yeah, exactly. But now that she sees her son doing that, you know, her son's getting up every morning and going for a walk, coming back, making a healthy breakfast, and he's feeling great. He looks amazing. He's happy. The mom's like, well, oh, hey, what's happening? What's going on? I want, I want some of that happiness. Like, I want to be radiant like that. And so they get whoever is around them in on it. And mm -hmm. that is amazing because not only do I get to coach the client, but indirectly, I'm helping everybody around them. And that feels Beautiful. really good. Yeah, that's awesome. So leading by example. Yeah, people don't really want to be told what to do. But when they see that example, like you said, of radiance or health or power or whatever, we get really curious about, well, how can I have some of that too? Yeah. And that's something that, you know, in my relationship with my girlfriend, me being a lifestyle coach and, you know, having growth as one of my core values, mm -hmm. I am constantly trying to help her. Like she's coming to me with <laughs> something that happened in her day and me as the coach, I want to help, yes. but she just wants her boyfriend to listen to her yes. and, you know, validate her feelings and just have somebody to talk to. Yeah. But for me, that's like, that's not how I operate. So I'm constantly trying to figure things out. Yeah. And so I've had to learn this the hard way is that it's, you know, to be inspirational. Sometimes you can't tell somebody what to do. It's more about asking better questions and then just leading by example, showing them that. And sometimes I might be wrong. Like I try to talk to my girlfriend and say, I think you should do this. But that's how I think it would work right. for me. And for her, it could be completely different. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, that's that incredible humility to actually be able to admit, right? You know, I have a way that I think this would go and I think this would be best and maybe not. Yeah. That's something I've struggled with because we've had so many, you know, arguments specifically the, the past few months of, you know, just miscommunication like this. And it's yeah. once you start to realize that, you know, for me, I don't know everything. I especially don't know what's going to help her. Uh -huh. And a lot of times she's telling me exactly what she wants. Uh -huh. But in my head, you know, my ego going back to that. Yeah. No, I know what is right. Listen to me. And so I just need to relax and say, okay, maybe I am wrong. Yeah, maybe most likely she is right. And I should listen to her. Yeah. Right. And that there's a way of, okay, there's, there's something in what she's saying or what anyone's saying that is right. Yeah. And can we kind of honor that and work from there 
versus the different my perspectives. Way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, communication and perspective is the cause of every single issue known to man. Mm. Because if I was in that person's shoes and I grew up the same way they grew up, I probably would have done probably the have the same, same, right. You'd probably do the same things, think the same thoughts. Most people are just trying to do the best they can with yeah. what they know. Yeah. And most people I really are love psychopaths, unfortunately, but yeah. Yeah, there, there are a few, but I really love that sense of assuming the best about people, you know, really actually getting, okay, there's a reason that they're doing what they're doing. And if I can start to understand why they might be doing it, then there's some collaboration possible. Then we can actually work together. Yeah, that was very hard for me to, and I'm still working on it, Yeah, you know, because still there's that part inside of me that wants them to fail or, you know, wants to get revenge or for whatever happened. But then yep. thinking about it, it's like, no, like for them to, you know, if they leave a hate comment or whatever, it's like somebody has to be hurting right. so much and in a, such a bad place that they would want to put out negative energy onto yes. somebody else. So then I, I start to feel compassionate and empathetic towards them. It's like, wow, mm, they must be really amazing. going through something. Yeah. And that just completely changes my perspective. And it makes living a lot more enjoyable because you're not all angry and pissed off all the time. Right. Right. I mean, you know, one benefit is for them, but the other benefit is that you don't have to walk around with all of that intensity and anger. Well, and everybody you. can succeed. Yeah. Uh, this is the last thing I'll say. Everybody yeah. can succeed. The, you don't have to wish anybody harm or, you know, everybody has the opportunity to succeed. Like, like there's enough. It sounds like there's enough. There's enough to go around. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What, what else do you want to leave men with as they're thinking about, you know, work life balance, optimizing their lives? What other seeds of wisdom do you have? I'm going to steal this one from my client. So I interview a lot of my clients after they go through the program and I ask them, you know, what would their advice be for somebody? Yeah. And I really liked his and it's just ask for help uh, because men especially that. are so conditioned to, to figure not. it out for themselves. Yeah. Got to do it on my own. I got to be the rock. I got to be the strong one. Yes. But once you ask for help, whether that's hiring a business coach or getting a personal trainer, nutritionist, or going to therapy, once you ask for help, yes, it's very difficult to, to actually come to that step. But it's the same thing with people who struggle to go to the gym. Once you actually get in the car and go to the gym, you know, then it's easy. You're there. Yeah. But so once you can make that step, things just start to get better. So yeah, ask for help. I agree. Well, thank you so much for both your, you know, the worldly view you have and the way that you you've seen a lot, you've experienced a lot, and I can feel your humility as well as your, what I say, you know, your drive, your commitment, your dedication to health and growth and well-being and to other peoples who you work with. So thank you so much for being a man on this planet who is supporting others to do good and to be happy. Thank you for having me. This was amazing. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.